to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, is where our text is found today. If you don't have a Bible with you, uh, then that's perfectly fine. If you're in the room, grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 963, 963, and you will find our text today, Matthew 5. And uh, if you're in the room and you don't own a Bible, you don't have one and you want one, please take one of those with you. We want you to have a Bible. And if you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible, we want you to have a Bible. Uh, but you can't take one with you because you're not here right now. But if you will let us know that you want a Bible and you need a Bible, we will get one to you. So we want everyone to have a Bible. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. So uh, we're talking about our final core value today. Now, we started this series, This Is Us, talking about our mission. The mission of Calvary is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. That's why we do what we do. That's why we exist. That's why we put it on our wall here at Sweetwater up in big letters. We want you to know what our mission is. And, and we've been introducing to you our updated core values. Uh, you know, we started this by talking about relatable truth. If we read and apply God's word, God will change your life. You might have heard that before. Uh, we, then we talked about transparent living, that God desires us to be real, open, and honest and allow others to do the same, that we don't want to hide we want uh, to admit that we're sinners and we have been forgiven by the amazing grace of Jesus Christ. And then, of course, we talked about contagious celebration, that following Jesus results in joy and that joy-filled life draws other people to Jesus. So we want to celebrate. We want to party. We want to be happy. We want to laugh. We do not want to take ourselves too seriously because the good news is just that. And then last week, Pastor Joe talked about uncomfortable grace that followers of Jesus give the same limitless grace they have received. We talked about how incredible it is to experience the love and mercy of God in Jesus Christ and how incredible that is to give it to the people in our lives, the people around us. And today we're talking about radical service. Radical service. Followers of Jesus best demonstrate love to others through acts of kindness and service. Followers of Jesus best demonstrate love to others through acts of kindness and service. Now, we're sharing these core values with you because we want you to know who we are. Okay, that's where we started. That's where we continue to be. If you're already part of the Calvary family, we want you joining us and living out the mission through these core values. Okay, this is what we expect those who are part of Calvary to look and act like. And then if you're checking us out, we want to be absolutely honest because that's transparent living about who we are and about what it means to be part of Calvary. And, and if you're here and you're considering following Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we want you to understand what a life in Jesus is supposed to look like and, and what we're hoping that, uh, that you'll find appealing and today you'll decide that you're gonna follow Jesus. You'll decide to make that life-changing commitment to Jesus Christ. And, and next week, just to give you a little uh, preview, Pastor Joe and I are going to be sharing about the vision of where we believe God's leading us as a church and as individuals over the next seven years. So uh, today, radical service. Followers of Jesus best demonstrate lo uh, love to others through acts of kindness and service. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 16 is what is in your bulletin for our text. I want to start back uh, on the previous page, verse 14. Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's talking to the people who are listening to him. And he says this, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your father who is in heaven. See, we believe that serving is love in action. Serving is love in action. Did you catch what Jesus said in verse 16? Let your light shine before others. Why? So they may see your good works, and out of that, give glory to your Father who is heaven. In other words, they're going to see the way you live your life, and they're going to praise God because of it. They're going to trust Jesus because of it. It's going to lead them to that life-changing relationship with God. Jesus. Now, that's why we serve people 
individually. That's why we serve the community because it is the only way, I think, to convince the unchurched that we love them. It's the only way to convince people that don't go to church, that don't know the good news, that don't know the living hope that we're singing about and talking about, that we, who call ourselves followers of Jesus, love them. Now, the church has always declared its love for people. How, how many of you grew up kind of going to church? Some kind of church, anyways. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. We've always said, oh, we love people. We've always been told you're supposed to love people. The church has always declared God's love for people. Um, the problem is, a lot of people didn't feel very loved by the church. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of people who said, uh, yeah, you Christians say that you love people, but I know a lot of unchurched people who would beg to differ. You guys know them too? You know who I'm talking about? You, know, you see, I mean, and a lot of us that grew up in church, we'd go, yeah, there's mean people in church. Okay, I mean, you know, uh, pastors, deacons, all the way down. Uh, it's just kind of like uh, it's, a, it's a repository for some mean people. And, you know, and aside from the fact that there are churches that fight like cats and dogs and there are churches that, you know, just are filled with mean people, the churches I went to emphasized abstinence from evil, which, by the way, so does the Bible. You know, the Bible encourages us to live a holy life. But their, their whole thing was, hey, you're a good Christian by, by what you don't do, right? I don't drink, smoke, cuss, or chew, or run with girls who do. Okay, <laughs> that, that was the, the old adage I heard a lot. You know, it's like, okay, what are you not doing? So you're, you're holy because you're not doing this stuff. So basically, I remember being taught that people can tell that I'm a Christian, but what I didn't do. Now think about that logic. That's what was being taught. You're holy if you don't do this, and if you don't do that, and if you don't go here, and you don't do it. And, and so our focus was on not doing. Our focus was on inaction. But honestly, that did not create a hunger in my unchurched friends to know Jesus. They just thought I was a boring religious nerd. Okay? Just being honest. In fact, a lot of the kids in my youth group thought I was a boring religious nerd. Because I was a boring religious nerd. Okay, that, that's what I was taught. And I thought, okay, I'm, I'm being holy. How come it's not working? And then it occurred to me, we can't represent the love of Jesus to a lost world by our inaction. I'm gonna say that again. We, as followers of Jesus, cannot represent the love of God to a lost world by what we don't do. You see, they need to see good deeds. Let your light shine before men so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. They need to see our good deeds. They need to see our acts of kindness. They need to see us serving in order to validate the message of life change. Uh, you think about it. If love is a theory, if love is just a concept that we talk about and not put into action, is it really love? I mean, the Apostle James says that faith without works is dead. So is love without action really love? Or is it just a nice idea? How about this? The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 5, but God demonstrates his love towards us in this. While we were sinners, what did Jesus do? He died for us. See, that's love in action. God demonstrates his love for us in this. While you were a sinner, Jesus died for you. He did something. It wasn't inaction, it was action. And so I submit to you that serving is love in action. That's why radical service is one of our core values. And not only is serving love in action, but serving is a relational attitude. A relational attitude. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. The Apostle Paul says, do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but rather with humility of mind, consider others more important than yourselves. Do not only look after your own interests, but also the interests of others. I mean, the Apostle Paul is saying, look, if, if you're going to actually represent Jesus, if you're going to have the attitude of Jesus, then you need to serve people. 
It's an attitude that you have. Serving others is not a project. Serving others is not an event you attend. It is an attitude. It's a lifestyle that you choose to live. Jesus told us that he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He said, this is my identity. He goes, if you want to be great, which everybody wants to be great, right? If you want to be great, you have to be the servant of all. It's, it's what he calls us to. So Jesus came to be a servant, not just to do some service projects. And, and I just got to tell you, Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. If I have to pick one single verse, you guys know when I preach, I, this is one of my favorite verses, one of my favorite verses. All the time, it's one of my favorite verses. This is the one that probably altered my life more than any other single verse as a follower of Jesus. When God confronted me with Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, do nothing from selfish ambition. Stop being a selfish pig, Okay. But instead, with humility of mind, consider others more important than yourself. God did not say they are more important than you. You are absolutely important to him. But he said, consider others as if they are more important than you. Live your life with a different kind of attitude where you see other people differently. It was life-changing for me. Because the more I focused on living as a servant, the more I focused on having that attitude of Jesus, do you know what happened? The more God redeemed my life. The... the I mean, he redeemed my relationships. He, he, the, my marriage got better. My family was healthier. All of that happened because I committed to saying, okay, Jesus, I'm going to embrace this idea of, of serving others, not just doing service projects, but I'm going to live as a servant. And, and by the way, while I was doing that, personally, it helped Calvary to be a better church too. Yeah, it helped me as a pastor, but it, I, I didn't do it as a pastor. I did it as a follower of Jesus, and it affected everything. But I, I want you to, to think, this doesn't apply just to, to, like, pastors and people in leadership and ministry. This is for all of us. Adopting a servant attitude is transformational for every single part of your life. So if you want to follow Jesus, if you want to imitate Jesus, if you want to become more like Jesus, it requires a commitment to being a servant, not just doing service events. Living your life with a servant attitude. And, I, and I'm telling you, a church full of servants is what it will take to accomplish the mission of Jesus. For us to be able to lead people to a life-changing relationship in Lake Havasu City, in Parker, and to the ends of the earth where God calls us. But we can't just be a church full of servants unless you choose to be a servant. And, and I'm just going to tell you, I, I think a lot of us get stuck at this point in following Jesus because we like the idea of being a servant, but we don't like the idea of living it out because it means that we have to personally repent of our selfishness and we have to start thinking differently about all of our relationships. But if your marriage is stuck in mediocrity, Decide to be a servant to your spouse. If your family isn't what you want it to be, decide you're going to be a servant to your kids. If your friendships are lacking, decide you're going to be a servant to your friends or to people that you want to be your friends. It changes the dynamic of every single relationship, and through that, God blesses you because you are imitating Jesus at the very core of who Jesus is. His identity is the suffering servant. And like I said, I know that confronts our default sin of selfishness, that we just want to do what we want to do when we want to do it. We want our way and want people to take care of us and we want people to serve us and we want others to wait on us. And, and yet God calls us to be servants. Look, if we did this as a church, not only would it transform our community through people coming to faith in Jesus, but our marriages and our families would be healthier. Our relationships would be healthier. And not only that, we'd be the best employees that anybody ever had. And we'd operate the most successful businesses doing the very best customer service of anyone out there. And people would see our good works and they would praise our Savior. And they would go, you're not like other people churches I've been to. You're not like other Christians I've met. So basically, if you want God to bless your life, have a servant attitude. Have a servant attitude. And, and 
and sharing this, that's why radical service is so important. This is why serving is Calvary's primary mission strategy. It's our primary mission strategy. Look, we've already told you, we want to reach Lake Havasu City. We want to reach Parker with the gospel. We want to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And our whole strategy is wrapped up in serving. It, it's, it's wrapped up in serving. You say, how are we going to do this? How are we going to be successful? How are we going to reach people? How are we going to lead them to Jesus? Look, we believe serving people, serving our communities is key to accomplishing the mission of leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Here's why. This is how our strategy works. First of all, we believe that relationship precedes rebuke. Relationship precedes rebuke. Um, the church has the gospel. Okay? The truth that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world, that he died on the cross to pay for our sins, that he was raised from the dead, and whoever believes in him, whoever confesses him as Savior and Lord is going to have eternal life. Look, the church has that message. The church has had that message. The church has been proclaiming that message. The problem isn't the message. The problem is the world isn't listening. And no matter how much we want them to listen, they're not listening. They've tuned us out. We can yell louder all we want. They'll just turn up the volume of what they're doing. And by the way, we're the same way. Hey, when was the last time that you really went out of your way to accommodate the Jehovah's Witnesses when they showed up at your door? Right? They're like, nope, don't have time. Take, sorry. Watching football. Nope. You know, it just, I, don't make time for them. When was the last time that you let a pushy salesperson at a store really, you know, sell you on something? You're like, no, get out of my face. I don't want to tell you. I don't, I don't want to listen to that. Right? See, our, our problem isn't the message. The message is truth. The problem is the gospel is a rebuke to how people live. Do you realize that? If you embrace Jesus, you're saying, I've been doing it wrong, and I need to repent. I need to stop doing what I was doing, and I need to turn my life over to Jesus, and I need to follow Jesus. It is a radical life change. And how many of you are going to radically change your life based on the words of a stranger? I don't even change my life based on the words of friends. I got lots of friends who tell me to stop drinking Diet Pepsi. It's going to kill me. I'm like, glad you care. Want one? No, I mean, so we don't. We don't, you know, and that's somebody we know. So here, here's the strategy. We want to build relationships with people who are unchurched so that at some point they can hear the truth. Let me say that again. We want to build relationships with people who are far from God so at some point they're going to say, tell me more. Tell me about your story. Tell me why you have a different attitude. Tell me why you're doing this. You see, Calvary serving the community, you serving in the community, puts you shoulder to shoulder and face to face with people who are far from God, not so you can preach at them. That is not the goal but so they can see your good work, so they can watch how you love people, so they can observe your kindness and witness your integrity up close and then want to know why. And want to know why. Now, you got to be ready to tell them why, and you also actually have to live that out. See, the problem is a lot of people know Christians, and we haven't represented Jesus very well. That's why we say, you know, you can't really represent Jesus unless you reflect his character. And that means that we actually have to practice kindness and we actually have to be people who love and we have to show integrity and, and, and we have to be encouragers and we have to be positive people out in the community when we're there. And if we do that, they will see that and they will invite conversation. And then when people ask why, they're actually inviting rebuke. They're actually inviting information that will challenge the way they live because you're sharing with them what Jesus has done for you. Why are you so different? Because of Jesus, because you changed my life. Here's who I was, here's who I am because of the Savior who has forgiven my sins, who has set me free, who's given me eternal life, who changes my attitude. All they can say is, okay, they asked. There's no anger, there's no frustration, you're sharing. And they're willing to listen to the message of life change out of that relationship preceding rebuke. That's why we serve. 
Okay, we serve because relationship precedes rebuke and we serve to earn the right to be heard. We want to earn the right to be heard. That may sound crazy, but for generations, the church had the right to be heard. In Western civilization, the church was at the center of society and people automatically, even if they didn't go to church, even if they didn't believe it, they recognized the church as an authority that had something to offer to us. And so we had to at least stop and be quiet while they were talking. Guess what? The rules have changed. The world has changed. We're not a Christian-based nation anymore. We're not a culture that recognizes the authority of the church in any way, shape, or form. Uh, America is just, we're, we're a secular nation now. And either people don't know what we believe or don't care what we have to say, or even worse, they've had a bad experience with the church or with Christians, and they're really not interested, and they've dismissed everything we have to say. By the way, I know that's true because I apologize all the time to people who've been hurt by churches and by pastors. And you say, well, why do I apologize? I apologize because nobody else has. And I grieve the fact that we have hurt them. The church has hurt them. And I remind them, that is not Jesus. That is not Jesus. That is not our Lord and Savior. That is not what he came to communicate. And I am sorry that people hurt you in the name of Christ. And I understand that I want to earn the right to have a conversation with them about faith. I feel like I need to earn that right. They don't owe that to me. And by the way, earning that right happens in two ways. First of all, it happens by living a life of service that invites the questions, that validates uh, who you are, validates your integrity. So living a life of a servant usually earns you the right to be heard by some. And the other thing is listening. Listening. You see, for years, the church wanted to have a monologue. We're going to tell you how you live your life. We're going to tell you how you live your life. And for years, for decades, for generations, people said, okay, the church tells us how we're supposed to live our life. And then what did they do? They went and did whatever they want, but they did it in private. Now people just do whatever they want, whenever they want, wherever they want. They don't care if it's private or not. Right? It's, it's, they're just not playing games anymore. But... We need to listen to them. We need to have a dialogue with them. We need to say, hey, tell me what you believe. Tell me about your experiences in life. Tell me what's going on. We need to listen. Because you can't really have a relationship unless you listen to people. There's no friendship. There's no trust unless you listen to people. Stop thinking about the monologue and start inviting a dialogue. After all, the Apostle James said, you should be quick to listen Slow to speak and slow to get angry because the anger man doesn't accomplish God's righteousness. Okay? Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Look, the church for years has been quick to speak and slow to listen and quick to get angry. And if we're going to have that servant attitude, if we're going to serve our communities, if we're going to do this, then we have to change the way we interact with people who are far from God because they are not the enemy. They are the ones that need rescuing. They're the ones who need that living hope infused into their lives. And and we who've experienced that living hope, we're the ones who are responsible to take that message to them. And so we need to earn the right to be heard. And so if we serve them and if we listen to them, then we're gonna make Calvary an easy yes. Okay, this is is the, the linchpin of the whole strategy right here. Okay, we want to make Calvary an easy yes. Now this assumes... Some really important things. This assumes that you want your family and your friends to experience a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Do you guys want your family and friends to experience a life-changing relationship with Jesus? (laughs) Some of you do. Some of you are like, nah, let them burn. (laughs) If you knew my family, let let them burn. Hey, you know, we can laugh, but the truth is our attitude a lot of times is ambivalent. So do you want your family and your friends to experience a life-changing relationship with Jesus? Okay, then if you do, guess what you're going to do? You're going to actually invite them to come to church with you. You're not going to tell them they should go to church. You're going to invite them to come to Calvary with you. If you're joining us online, you're going to invite them to watch the service with you, and then you're going to have dinner and talk about it. 
You know, because, because you can. This is relationship-based. And what we want to do is we want to make it easy for your family and your friends to accept your invitation to Calvary. By the way, the statistics still say, this is crazy, but 60 to 80, depending on who you read, 60 to 80% of unchurched people say they would go to church if a friend or family member invited them. Okay, everybody tells us people aren't interested in God, they're not interested in church, not gonna go. But if you have a relationship with someone and they already trust you, and I'm also assuming they like you, okay? It's more believable with some than others in this room, but that's okay. Look, they like you, you're friends with them, you're hanging out with them, you're bowling with them, you're going to movies with them, you're going to dinner with them, you're going to car shows with them, whatever it is you're doing with them, then there's relationship of trust, then you can say, hey, why don't you come to church with me? And, and here's why we're trying to make Calvary an easy yes. And they're gonna ask you some questions. You, you say, come to church with me, they're gonna go, what church? Right? Some of you have had this conversation. You know the questions they're gonna ask. Everybody asks the same questions. What church do you go to? You're gonna say Calvary. They're gonna say, is that the church that does the Main Street thing with the kids? Is, are you guys the church that serves the schools and goes out there and paints and cleans? Are you guys the church that, that puts on the, the prom for the people with special needs? Are, are, are you guys that church? And you go, yeah, we are. And they go, oh, maybe I could come with you. Um, and then they're gonna ask these questions, okay? They're gonna ask two, they're gonna think a third one. They're gonna ask you, how long does it last? <laughs> and you guys all know it lasts about an hour, right? I mean, we're, we do that on purpose so that you can invite your friends. And so you can say an hour. Because if your friend likes you, they'll pretty much give you an hour. Right now, if you say, I don't know, hour and a half, two hours, you're like, no, check, please. I'm out. Can't do that. So you go an hour. They're like, oh, okay. What do I have to wear? And what's your answer? Whatever you want to wear, right? Unless you're in the channel at the time. <laughs> Use your judgment at that point. Uh, but, you know, you're just going to say, hey, whatever you, whatever you want to wear. It's casual. I'm going like this. I tell people that all the time. What do you have to wear to church? This is what I wear and I preach. So go, go for it. And, uh, uh, and the only people who bat an eye are church people, like, oh, <laughs> you wear that? Yeah, you're not welcome. Uh, so <laughs> now you can come, but we're, you're not our target. We don't care. So, um, and so you tell them that, and they're like, oh, the third question they're not going to ver verbalize most of the time is, is it going to be weird? Yeah. They're gonna, is it going to be weird? And you're like, no, it's not going to be weird. Don't worry about it. Nobody's going to, like, do something weird to you. Uh, so they're asking, we're trying to make it an easy yes so that you can invite them to come and experience the possibility of life change. Um, especially if it's a friend or coworker or family member that already trusts you. Because relationship precedes rebuke. So that's why radical service is a core value at Calvary because followers of Jesus best demonstrate love to others through acts of kindness and service. So closing questions. First of all, are you a servant? Now, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus, I was gonna say this, if, if you're a follower of Jesus and you can't answer, yes, I'm a servant, you're living in rebellion against your Savior. We've already talked about why. We've already talked about the identity piece. I just want you to know that if you want to be in a place where God blesses you, then you need to move towards being a servant. Not just doing service stuff, but being a servant. So, are you a servant? Secondly, how will you serve? How will you serve? Now, some of you are already serving, and you're like, yes, I got the answers to this one. I'm rocking this. But there's lots of options in front of you. How are you going to serve? Well, we got the community events. I already mentioned a bunch of them. The Halloween Fright Night, uh, candy and, and blessing kids. You know, we, in November, we'll hand out gift bags and to set up angel trees so you can bless people with Christmas presents. You know, we, we do serve our schools. We do teacher appreciation. We have the prom for uh, people with special needs. All that's coming up. Lots of opportunities for you to bless the community in serving. Car show, et, et cetera. And then we got weekend support ministries. I mean, we got the things that, that make that weekend happen. We could use your help. I mean, we got, if you're, if you're friendly, we got first impressions, okay? 
If you're technical, we got tech ministry. If, if you can sing or play, we got worship arts. If you like kids, uh, we've got children's ministry. We got student ministry during the week. We got security ministry, in case you want to like, arrest people. Uh, we got all kinds of things. We, you know, we've got ways that you can serve uh, on the weekend or during the week. Uh, we've got community involvement. Look, we want you to go and represent Jesus in the community, volunteering in, you know, for nonprofits and organizations so that you are nose to nose, face to face, shoulder to shoulder with people who are far from God. Again, not so you can preach at them, but so that you have opportunities to build a relationship and bring them with you to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And then, of course, we've got the opportunity to lead life groups. Where, where you can be involved in shepherding the people who are caring for this community. So however you choose to serve, how about we agree that we demonstrate love to others through acts of kindness and service? Because if we're gonna accomplish the mission of leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus, we need to own radical service. Let's pray. Father, it still blows my mind that you served us. King of kings and Lord of lords, the creator of heaven and earth, you served us. You sent Jesus to be the suffering servant to pay for our sin, to rescue us from our rebellion. And then you give us the privilege of being servants of the King of kings and Lord of lords. So Father, transform our minds, change our hearts, let us embrace a new identity that's rooted in Jesus that you use to transform the communities that we live in. We cannot do this without you. We need you. And so we invite you right now to move in our midst, speak to our hearts, and call us out to be your servants. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.